Okay, good. Okay, so uh, I guess I'm, we need to start. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, so. Okay. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, ni hao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo. Hello all. Welcome and thank you for joining us the 19th seminar and Northwestern University Day. I hope you are all okay, although the winter storm affected many. And also we have accumulation up to 12 inch of snow, even here in St. Louis, while the temperature two days ago was almost 60 Fahrenheit. And I think indeed climate crisis. Today, I'm so excited to say we are starting the new format, changing from webinar to Zoom. I believe this new format allows audience to talk and turn on the camera if you wish. And at the end of the talk, you will have an opportunity to turn on your camera and ask yourself if you wish or you can still type your question in the chat box. However, audience, during the presentations, please mute yourself and then you will have the chance to speak after talk end. Simbis started with several hundreds of audience for the first seminar with Professor Francis Arnold, Dr. Teresa Good at NSF at R. However, I got so many emails after the first seminar, especially from Africa, Asia, and Australia, where their time zone is not convenient for this seminar. So they discussed in the sharing of the recorded video. And of course, in response, I became a YouTuber after getting permission from all the speakers releasing the video to the world. And as expected, the number of live audience decreased a lot after the video release and decrease more week after week, while most audience watch the YouTube videos. Now with total of more than 16,000 views for 18 videos when I checked the other day. So in other words, roughly 900 views per video on average. Okay. It is my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Mike Jewitt. He is a professor at Northwestern University. That's why I call this day is the Northwestern University Day and the director of Center for Synthetic Biology there. He is the person who made Northwestern Symbio people gather together and recruit young rising stars to his school, enabling the Central Synthetic Biology Consortium to launch with universities in the central region, including WashU. And of course, he is now serving as the editor in chief of ACS Synthetic Biology after Chris Voigt's 10 years of service and of course, I need to finish another paper review for him, although I did finish one very recently. So Mike, the virtual podium is all yours now. Thank you very much, Jason, uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, it's a real honor to try to celebrate what the field has accomplished, where the field is headed, and in particular to be speaking and the same session as Aditya, who will be presenting his own research in greater depth uh, following these few words. Um, 
I thought I'd pull together just a few short slides that may highlight some of the areas that we're thinking about um, in our own research laboratory and how we imagine bioengineering beyond cells using cell-free systems may help facilitate a fair and sustainable 21st biocentury. So I have just a few minutes, but I think you know one thing that draws us all together is that we recognize that humanity is facing a series of challenges of a magnitude that we've never seen before. We recognize that human-caused climate change is altering the health of our planet. 30% of the world's population lacks access to essential medicines. At 1.1 trillion tons, human-made materials now outweigh all life on Earth, and more than 2 billion people lack access to clean water. Now, by combining disciplines and exploiting the intersections between them, synthetic biology has become one of the most promising fields of research to address these challenges in both planet health and societal health. And I think that as we look forward as a community, we begin to ask ourselves, how do we take advantage of this ability? How do we advance and apply our capacity to partner with biology, to make what is needed, where is needed, when it is needed, and on a sustainable and renewable basis. And I think that I, as I look forward to the future, that is the element that excites me the most. In my own research laboratory, we're advancing this vision through a recent innovations around just add water, cell-free synthetic biology. And the idea is that we can take cells, rip off their cell walls, collect the insides, and then program them with genetic circuits or enzymes for molecular transformations to facilitate the functions that we would wish to program in biology from diagnostics to manufacture, manufacturing to even educational kits. Kind of think of it like taking a car, lifting the hood up, pulling the engine out and repurposing the engine. We're repurposing the core engine of the cell without living intact cells to advance a vision of sustainable and equitable biotechnologies. Um, let me give you just one small example today around protein medicines. I think we all recognize that protein medicines have transformed our ability to prevent and treat human diseases from antibodies to vaccines to hormones, enzyme replacement therapies. Really, these medicines have transformed the lives of millions of people. Yet, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the World Health Organization estimates that about 30% of the world's population lacks access to essential medicines. So why? What are the challenges? Well, one of the issues is that our ability to distribute protein medicines is limited by the fact that we have centralized manufacturing approaches where we manufacture medicines in large centralized facilities that can cost hundreds of millions of dollars to billions of dollars or more, where we grow microorganisms in deep fermentation tanks. We manufacture these medicines, we purify them, and then we need to distribute them to their point of use. And so really our ability to produce and deliver new medicines can be limited by the expense and time required to build such facilities and the feasibility of refrigerated supply chains. Certainly we've seen that in the context of COVID-19 RNA vaccines and how they might be distributed around the world. So low cost portable biomanufacturing platforms could broaden access to medicines if we learn how to make them locally, regionally by making them when and where they're needed. And we and several others are trying to reimagine protein manufacturing in this vision, where for example, in our own group and collaborations with Matt Delisa's lab through quite a few innovations of a previous graduate student, Jessica Stark, we've created a local distributed vaccine production technology where we create glycocompetent E. coli cells, prepare cell-free extracts from those, freeze drives those systems, and then allow for the manufacture of protein conjugate vaccines to address pathogenic bacteria in a portable on-demand setting. And what's really cool is these systems are fast, modular, portable, safe, and can even produce products at scale. And as we think about that vision, just to put some numbers on it, if you imagine a five microgram antigen dose, we now produce protein medicines on order of 0.1 grams antigen per liter in about an hour. So if you had a local or regional manufacturing facility, you could imagine manufacturing a dose in the morning and in the evening. Um, this would allow us to have 0.1 grams antigen per liter per batch, say we could do two batches per day, all at five micrograms a dose. So in a single liter, a single carton of milk, we can make 40,000 doses per day. 
extending this to 1,000 liters, 40 million doses a day, and extending this to running that reactor for three weeks, you could imagine making medicines for more than a billion people in roughly three to four weeks, all at the moment at about 50 cents per dose in this just add water vision, a lot of which was embedded in a paper we published last year in Science Advances. Now this just add water technology not only is useful for making medicines, but it's really important for enabling educational literacy and citizenship in synthetic biology. And through a collaboration with Jim Collins at MIT, Jessica Stark shown here, Ali Wong and Jim's lab and Peter Nguyen also working with Jim, we developed these BioBits kits to teach synthetic biology. And I think it's important that we recognize the value and the urgency that it is for all of us as a community to inspire others to pursue STEM educational opportunities through, for example, in this case, um, in vitro genetic programs that allow us to make kind of the universal light bright uh, where people have made everything from a periodic table to even playing a game of Connect Four. So building literacy, of course, in Synthetic biology is going to encourage students to pursue careers in STEM, but what other problems can we solve? Well, that's where I'm going to leave you today, because that's going to get us to Aditya's talk about where else can we be solving important problems. But I encourage us all, as we imagine that future, to think and rethink about how we can build human capacity to support synthetic biology across engineering, policy, security, culture, ethics art, leadership, how do we build the community we wish to have to make the impact we wish to have, enabled by tools for making biology easier to engineer, and of course, applying those tools across scales to solve the world's most pressing problems. So with that, uh, Taysuk, thanks again for the fantastic opportunity to be here today. I'm thrilled to participate and looking forward to the real seminar. Oh my goodness. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So you know, as always, I mean, you always give the amazing talk and it's, you know, today I hear very inspiring insight and vision. Uh, that's, a, you know, I completely agree with you, of course, regarding the global issues, including climate crisis, health, medicine, vaccine, water issue, et cetera, which can be solved by biotechnologies such as Safety system, and also, of course, by education uh, and others. So, given, of course, the COVID vaccine are made by Safety, which I heard from my own student, Tatenda, who developed the process at Pfizer, I believe we have huge potential uh, in this field. Okay, so now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction. Arira Kumjakpur is an assistant professor in chemical and biomolecular engineering at University of Delaware, where he has been since December 2018. Arita's research training experience had spanned metabolic protein and genome engineering under the supervision of Crystalla Prader at MIT and Jody Church at Harvard Medical School. He earned bachelor's and doctoral degrees in chemical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin in 2010 and at MIT in 2015. His group at Delaware strives to expand the microbial chemistry repertoire with an emphasis on generating underrepresented and useful functional groups on building blocks molecules. Application of interest include new materials, protein conjugate therapeutics, living therapeutics, and plant probiotics. For the latter, to applications, the lab also focus on advancing strategies for intrinsic biological containment. Arira and his students have been recognized through various awards, including the Emerging Leaders in Biosecurity Initiative Fellowship in 2019 
and the 35 under 35 award from the American Institute of Chemical Engineers in 2020. And Arira is also a council member of the Engineering Biology Research Consortium, EBRC, and a thrust co-director and executive committee member of the Center for Plastic Innovation. And also importantly, he got Langer Prize, uh, that is the last year, I believe, and also a steering committee member of the Chemistry Biology Interface T32 training grant program at the University of Delaware. Most importantly, he just got very recently ONR Young Investigator Program Award. And this is very exciting. So he's a true rising star. And it's my tremendous honor to have you today. And Adita, take it away. It's all yours. And thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Taysok, for that lovely introduction and really for creating this platform for myself and you know a wide variety of other trainees and young assistant faculty members you know at all kinds of stages um, during a time where it's been hard to engage with audiences and to network so really appreciate all the work that you've done to create this platform um, before i start sharing my slides as well i'd really like to acknowledge um, how much of an honor it is to present after mike um, you know uh, his decision uh, and to postdoc in George Church's lab and his success there and afterwards um, really shaped my decision to follow in his footsteps or at least try to um, with that path. And so um, it's exciting to, but always nerve wracking to to follow in his footsteps and giving a talk right after him as well. Um, and so let's see if I can share my screen here. Um, great, I think. You all can see that. Let me just make it larger. So I am displaying this on a second monitor. So I'll occasionally look away and, and back at the video camera. Uh, I'm also remiss to say thank you all, whether you're joining live or you know watching this on YouTube. I appreciate your attendance. And for those of you who are live, looking forward to any kind of engagement um, you know, after I present. Um, so I titled the talk a little bit more around what my lab does or aspires to do. Um, but what I'll actually tell you about in part with the spirit of you know, having this be recorded on YouTube is uh, about half of my talk will be work in the, that's already in the public domain, kind of setting the stage for the biological containment work that Taysok mentioned. And it, you know, it was, I think, pretty well motivated in, in large part also by what Mike mentioned just when you see, for example, the ability and the advancement of cell-free synthetic biology to really bring synthetic biology into new contexts, one of, one of the real questions and opportunities for the field, I think, is what could we do with live cells if we were to take them out of you know, reactor-like environments? But can we even do that responsibly and safely? Um, and so in today's talk, I'll be giving you a, a hint of what my lab is trying to do but also talking a good bit about work that was done in the church lab. Okay, um, so a little bit about us. We're a, a relatively new lab, although with the pandemic, it's hard to really keep track of time. Um, when the pandemic started, there were just four of us in my group, and now we've, we've grown to 12. So um, Taysok provided a pretty thorough introduction, so I won't mention more other than, you know, I like to acknowledge the institutions where I train. Um, and so now I've got trainees, and uh, we have about 10 graduate students and two postdocs. Um, and thanks to, to their exciting work and sort of setting the stage and preliminary data for our lab, we're, we're starting to, to feel some success uh, with funding agencies as well. So we are going to continue to grow. Um, and so if you are a faculty member, uh, you know, uh, think about sending your students or recommending that they apply to Delaware. And if you're a trainee in the audience, definitely consider our lab or other labs at Delaware. Um, on that note, you know, University of Delaware and our chemical engineering department has changed a lot in the last few years. Um, we've been inspired by other institutions like Northwestern, for example, in having a cohort 
of synthetic biology and really seeing what um, a group of synthetic biology faculty can really do. And so in the last couple of years, we've added, well, myself and uh, Mark Blenner, um, who was formerly at Clemson, and um, Kevin Solomon, who was formerly at Purdue. We've also got Terry Papatsakis, Wilfred Chen, Kelvin Lee, and others who work adjacent to this in bio area. One thing that's kind of exciting um, with these faculty members in particular is we work across a wide variety of different kinds of organisms here at Delaware. So bacteria, fungal, mammalian species. Um, and many of our projects involve opportunities where these microbes or other cell lines can be interfacing with one another. Um, and so these kind of cross species or cross kingdom interactions um, allow for some interesting and emerging areas of collaboration. Um, the last thing I'll just mention since I know it's also the time of year of this talk is around recruitment season for new graduate students. So, um, you know, with a lot of these labs, uh, we are looking to, to make our presence better known as a synthetic biology program. The department at Delaware has long been a very strong chemical engineering department. But one of the new things that we have as well on our campus is um, uh, we have a biopharmaceutical manufacturing center. Um, and with it, a new building as well that you can see here on the bottom right. Um, so lots of interesting things happening at Delaware. Definitely consider us. Um, in, the, in terms of outreach, uh, you know, things like BioBits have been really inspiring. And I remember being in the MIT environment um, and, and having actually occasional conversations with Ali Huang as that technology was sort of developing. It's been difficult at times to get synthetic biology out of the lab and cell free technologies really helped transition that. It was in the past, pre pandemic, it was easier to get, well, relatively easier compared to now to get undergraduates or even high school students into the lab. And those experiences have been really hard to come by. Um, you know, seminar series like, like the one here that TASOC has set up are really helpful for, I think, the graduate student trainees. But I still, my lab in particular, we're interested in science communication and we're kind of wondering how do we still reach undergraduates and broaden the pipeline at stages before that. So some things we're trying to do, they're a little bit more straightforward, or so it seems, um, at least not as um, impaired by some pandemic logistics is we have a YouTube channel where so far I've been posting mostly undergraduate course lectures, but increasingly I'm going to try to move the content more towards um, more just fundamental, like general public layman kind of um, information about what synthetic biology is and how people who are interested in this area can, can get involved. So stay tuned for that. Um, th that video series should be a weekly one that I'll be trying to ramp up later this month. Um, all right, so now to the, to the science. Um, so it, in our lab, we do have a, an array of different projects, but generally they fall under one of two themes, which have to do with our interest in programming cells or living systems more generally to harness or create unusual building blocks. So at a high level, the reason why we're interested in this is, you know, part of what we wonder is synthetic biology has been able to accomplish a lot. And we know we have all these capabilities, for example, with biosensing, production, et cetera. Can we potentially take advantage of that for certain problems that may warrant it to be able to use live engineered cells outside of reactor context in a responsible way? Um, and I'll get to what that means shortly. The other question that I've been fascinated about ever since my graduate training in the Prather Lab is the potential of cells as biosynthetic platforms. Yet, we know that while we've been able to access a wider variety of you know, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen chemistries, synthetic chemists can do more in terms of accessing other kinds of functional groups. And a real question that I've sort of always wondered, at least once I became trained in this area, is can we teach living systems to create and then sustain uh, or make use of those kinds of chemistry? Um, and I think these two are actually sort of related in that 
you know, if we are enabling cells to do expanded kinds of chemistry, or if the problems that we're trying to tackle in the field, uh, meaning in the actual outside environments, um, require or benefit from some of those augmented chemical repertoires, then we want to be able to teach cells to be able to, to do more of that on their own. So what kinds of problems might we want to solve with engineered living systems in open contexts? Well, they, there's a lot of um, you know, shared, I think, recognition, even in, in Mike's talk you saw, with these challenges, both across sustainability, environmental health, and also human health, which I'll mention next. But um, one of the things that, that is a, a major opportunity, especially in areas where, for example, um, you know, we need uh, photos, we have photo autotrophs that need large land areas and potentially not many things in the way to harnessing sunlight and converting that into fuels or chemicals. Or you have distributed waste um, in which now species are, are being identified that can break those down, but at current paradigms are that you would then try to, you know, have maybe a fermentative process or enzymes still in a reactor in some kind of centralized facility. And in order to do that, you'd have to still address the, the issue of how do you collect this waste? What if you could just treat it in the environment? And, and to do that, you might actually need an organism that can persist for some time and be limited in terms of not growing in environments where you don't want it to. Agriculture is another major area where it's a little more obvious. We know that you know, a variety of rhizobacterial and other species in the rhizosphere, the parts of plants that are uh, you know, associated with the root and the soil in that area, they can play a huge influence in crop yields and um, protecting crops from disease. And that's an area where you can apply treatments transiently, but you may not be able to have uh, as strong of an effect as if you could have some capability over a longer period of time. And so self-replicating systems, if they could be used responsibly and controlled in these environments, could make a big difference in our approach. Um, similarly, you've actually already started to see in human health, um, startups as well as other kinds of entities uh, push through clinical trials or even into real therapies, um, engineered living systems. And one example is CAR T cells, for example. So there are fewer regulatory barriers here. It's less of an open environment but you still would ideally like to have control mechanisms that can allow you to um, you know, have increased capabilities. Um, for example, especially in the area of tumor homing, if you're engineering cells to try to destroy cancer cells uh, to mitigate off-target or long-term kind of impacts, it would be great to have control systems that can define the lifetime and restrict the environments of your engineered cells. So one of the, the questions then related to this that we've had and that others have had, in fact, TASOC's lab just had a paper come out in Nature Communications today on, on this topic, is you know, how can we use synthetic biology to restrict proliferation of an engineered cell in ideal environments? And so, um, I won't spend too much time uh, talking about this, but I did want to briefly highlight synthetic oxytrophy as a technique for intrinsic biological containment um, that we're interested in, in in my lab. And so the idea of a synthetic oxytroph, that you know, a regular oxytroph is one that is not is an organism that's not capable of making everything it needs from a simple carbon source. So a synthetic oxytroph has some kind of reliance on a synthetic input or molecule that it needs in order to survive. And conceptually, the details of this aren't so important, but the way that this was demonstrated in the church lab before I ever set foot there was through modification of essential enzymes to make them depend on the incorporation of a non-standard amino acid, which is depicted here just structurally different than the 20 standard amino acids. Um, it would be an L-alpha amino acid, and there's machinery um, that can help it uh, 
be inserted into the right position in the polypeptide sequence. You, one can actually modify the enzyme to have compensatory mutations that will only allow the enzyme to fold correctly if it has the non-steroid amino acid. Or you could simply make the enzyme's translation depend on the non-steroid amino acid being present. But in either case, the idea is that if you don't introduce this non-standard amino acid around the engineered cell, then it will not be able to make a functional version of this protein, and therefore it will not be able to survive or grow. So um, the foundational work on this um, was occurred in both the Church Lab and in Farron Isaac's lab at Yale. Um, and the Church Lab work led by Dan Mandel and Mark Lejoy um, showed really unprecedented levels of effectiveness in intrinsic biological containment. But again, it's a very ideal context. These were batch monocultures of E. coli synthetic oxytrophs grown in LB medium, and in general, uh, grown to about a volume of no more than a liter uh, in, in the presence of the non standard amino acid that they would need, then it would be washed away, plated, on media that doesn't contain the non steroid amino acid, let's see what grows. Um, and so uh, different markers were chosen, different enzymes to make have this dependence. And what was observed was when you com combined at least two of these, certain two, you would actually not observe any detectable escape. Now, one could argue you could always go larger. Um, and, and we started to think about that when I entered the lab. Um, the first question though that we tackled is, well, some of these do escape, can we make that better? Um, and some of these strains were also a little slow growing uh, because of these modifications. So um, in brief, some of the work that I first led when I joined the church lab was taking the machinery, which I really haven't told you anything about, but these are the systems that are used to make that non-standard amino acid go into a polypeptide sequence. We engineered that to be more specific because in short, the original system could grab some of the standard amino acids. And while that might not make a functional enzyme, it might make a semi-functional enzyme or lead to you know, essentially some protein that might be conformationally dynamic or misfolded, require degradation at some basal level that might've made cells sick and more prone to escape. We never really looked into those mechanisms, but what we did do was engineer a higher fidelity machinery. And what we were able to see with strains that could escape was that their escape rates became lower um, by, in some cases, two or three orders of magnitude when we put in the more specific machinery. But I mentioned that you know a lot of questions were still outstanding about this technology at this time. How well does it work uh, larger scales or longer time? So uh, through Michael Napolitano and Ariona Hisoli, members of the church lab, we tried to tackle that by instead of just trying to go larger, um, doing some continuous culturing. After all, if you are going to release a synthetic oxytroph in an open context uh, and you want it to survive for some period of time, then you have to account for the possibility that it might evolve. And so what would evolution look like and would, you know, what mechanisms of escape might there be? So we were really surprised actually to not see any escape and to in fact see adaptation um, to decreasing concentrations of BIPA, um, the non standard amino acid that this required. Um, what I'll tell you about then that was our, the next thing that we started to do with this relatively robust system was I asked first the question of how would synthetic oxytrophy perform or what kind of methods could we use to restrict proliferation in ideal environment? But now that we know that you know this technique seems to work in an ideal environment, for you know this evolution took place over the course of a hundred days. What about in less ideal environments? So one that's generally taboo is the idea of bringing bacteria into a tissue culture. Um, in fact, Ariana may not have told everyone in the church lab that she was doing this experiments but they were really exciting and we were looking forward to the results. So she um, is the one behind the imaging data that I'm gonna show you here, which is just that, um, you know, she focused on the human cell line, human embryonic kidney, HEC293T, 
T cells that were um, that had genome integrated M cherry expressed. And um, this is just controls of what that looks like in bright field and fluorescence microscopy over a seven day sort of seven days with calcigen, normal tissue culture, um, no bacteria. And then if you were to take uh, your standard E. coli cloning strain, E. coli DH5 alpha, which in this case was transformed to express the clover green protein. Um, and you added that in, in the tissue culture room to the HEC 293 T cell. Well, by the two day mark, you almost don't see the HEC 293 T cells anymore. Uh, of course, bacteria have a half faster growth rate and you know, do other things to the medium that may be toxic to mammalian cells when they grow at this level of abundance. So you get this unordinarily, and even in this case, unwanted contamination. Um, and so we knew that that was going to happen. The question is, what would a synthetic oxytroph be able to um, accomplish or exhibit really in this setting? Um, and so you've got, for example, the other organism, but you've also got a richer media. And the way we did this experiment was we grew the E. coli cells it, as any synthetic oxytroph would need in the permissive environment with its uh, non steroid amino acid at first to mid exponential phase, uh, washed and resuspended away the, the non steroid amino acid, introduced the bacteria to the mammalian cell culture, and then did daily passaging. And the only antibiotic that was present here was the one for plasmid maintenance. So this is an antibiotic that you know is not trying, it's just providing selective pressure um, to maintain green. Um, and what you can see after two days is, you know, the back, the synthetic oxytroph is still there. You can see plenty of, of green flecks, but the mammalian cells look quite normal and healthy. Um, and then by day four, there's just one or two green flecks. And by day seven, you don't actually see any bacteria anymore. And so this is a, an unprecedented sort of gradual clearance phenomenon without need for antibiotic. And it raised a number of interesting questions that you know, can be the basis of several different projects, you know, whether it's in this mammalian cell context specifically or another context. First, we observed that there's a, a persistence phenomenon. Um, the bacteria are surviving there even for days, anywhere between two to four days in our experience under different conditions without this amino acid being around. And so the, oh, um, I guess I was gonna get to that next. Um, actually, let me, uh, let me just mention that there is a control that we also did, which, which would show that if you did introduce the non standard amino acid, even for the synthetic oxytroph, it was fully capable then of being able to take over the population and continue. So this is a phenomenon that's not um, just because of the strain, um, but also, um, the, because of the dependence specifically on the non steroid amino acids. So as I was saying, um, there are a lot of interesting questions from this. One um, is, you know, how could you maybe alter that persistence time scale to make it more or less suited for applications in the field? It may be that you just want to introduce a living cell for its production of some biomolecule very transiently for just say, you know, four to eight hours, something like that. And so in that case, our synthetic oxytroph currently survives too long. And there are a variety of applications where four to eight might be enough because maybe what you're taking advantage of is the fact that the bacterium is able to associate or form some other kind of emergent property, a biofilm, et cetera. It could have to do with the transport of the molecule you're trying to deliver. For example, maybe to the root of a plant, et cetera. Um, and in those cases, there may be fewer concerns also about what happens to the recombinant DNA, et cetera. But there might be other situations where you actually say with sensing, want a, an organism to be in, the, in a, a defined environment for some period of time, maybe on the time scale of many days, many weeks. So uh, for each of those ideas, actually, we have different projects funded in the lab, different strategies to try to be able to tune the survival of the synthetic oxytroph for those different kinds of applications. But obviously, with this mammalian system, we've got something really interesting as well, 
a unique sort of platform that we still need to characterize further and that we now have a tissue culture room in my lab in Delaware to look at um, is, you know, what are these interactions like over longer time scales between bacteria and mammalian cells? We could be looking for more natural host microbe interactions or engineered interactions that could help us sense and respond to disease. And those could be for diagnostic purposes, those could be as a high throughput platform for R&D, or those could help shape the next generation of therapeutics that we introduce into human patients more safely. Um, and of course, we're thinking about the, whether it be an environment like the gut in a human patient where there are other microbes or the outside environments, other microbes are very wily creatures, and we know that microbes have ways of exchanging DNA and sharing their internal contents. So my lab is also very interested in kind of understanding as a critical next step, before we rush into any applications with this idea of a synthetic oxytroph, what's going to happen when it sees other microbes? Will they be able to break the biological containment or otherwise protect it? So those give you a hint at a number of different projects in my lab in this area. Another thing that we're doing is when we're talking about the field, E. coli really isn't the right model organism. And we recognized that during my time in the church lab as well, where I started a really neat co-advising relationship with George Church and Ethan Garner. So Devin Stork was working on incorporating non-standard amino acids into bacillus cells, which is a really great microbe because it has these properties both relevant in the biomedical space as well as the agricultural space, maybe most of all because bacillus cells can form spores that can then survive indefinitely um, in dry conditions, you know, up to uh, over 40 degrees centigrade for years, um, where now you can sort of imagine, uh, as Mike was talking about, distributed, you know, manufacturing or uh, biologics production. Spores give you a little bit, I mean, you actually consume a spore orally, uh, and there have been some vaccine candidates in that regard. You start to be able to tap into new areas where maybe living, or in this case, not vegetative, but semi-living systems are, are able to then access this wider range of applications that um, you know previously we haven't really considered for living systems. So we are able now to uh, incorporate non-standard amino acids in Bacillus subtilis, and that work was published um, in 2021. Um, for the sake of time, I won't, I'll just get really quickly into the other big question that we're interested in, which is, you know, for example, if you're trying to do distributed production of conjugate vaccines, could you make a conjugate, a protein conjugate, entirely biologically? And I think there are some, some very interesting glycoconjugate chemistries that can be entirely um, biosynthesized. What about other kinds of linkages, other kinds of uh, attachment chemistries? So we know that organic chemists, um, you know, they use some of these 21 functional groups shown here to do those kinds of things or to make polymers uh, with certain stronger or other property modulation linkages or to make synthons that you know, are able to, to more easily form complex molecules. When you look at these common organic uh, functional groups, um, what you find is that biology, as much rich diversity as there is in metabolism, secondary metabolism, et cetera, you don't see very commonly um, produce or especially retain uh, a wide range of, of these functional groups. In particular, when it comes to carbon, nitrogen, heteroatom chemistry, lot of functional groups that chemists love to use that um, occur very rarely, if at all, in biological systems. One other thing I'll just note here is from a green chemistry perspective, the way that synthetic chemists make and use these chemistries has a lot of room for potential improvement where biocatalysis could be not just that we can teach cells to do it all, but that we can come up with processes then that are uh, greener and more efficient. One of the less for the greenness, but more for the um, interesting sort of uh, new takes on on properties that we could achieve with functional group chemistries are nitro aromatic compounds. And in particular, when I started my lab, I was very interested in this nitro aromatic non-standard amino acid called paranitrophenylalanine or 
nitro P for short. Uh, chemical biologists like Peter Schultz and his alums laid an incredible foundation of tools to be able to place non-standard amino acids like this specifically within protein sequences in an encoded way where, you know, through an amber UAG stop codon, you could designate that for an amino acid like this. Not only did they develop those tools, they came up with an array of really interesting molecules that they synthesized chemically. One of them was nitrophenylalanine, which they showed could be an immunogenic amino acid. In fact, it could lead to the termination of self-tolerance. And immune self-tolerance is normally something that we want. You know, its termination sometimes means an autoimmune disease has occurred. But in other cases, especially where the, you have um, uh, cytokines like TNF-alpha, where some of the blockbuster antibody drugs, their main goal is to bind that to prevent chronic inflammation or to mitigate over-inflammatory processes. Um, you know, the, intro the ability to have your body maybe recognize TNF-alpha as an antigen and make antibodies against it could be interesting. Um, and so, in fact, uh, I want to tell you a little bit more about that work from the Schultz group, because what they did was they took murine TNF-alpha and they introduced a single nitrophenylalanine substitution on the surface of this protein. Um, actually, when they for control, they also had just the murine TNF alpha. When they administer that into mice, it's a self protein. It's, you know, not really it's recognized as self, and so you don't get much change in serum IgG. But when you have the nitrophenylalanine, what was observed was actually a polyclonal antibody response. And when people dug into that from the Schultz and other groups, it's because um, there were neoepitopes, nitrated epitopes, that were being presented by antigen presenting cells. And helper T cells would see and recognize those uh, antigens at epitopes, and then they would activate B cells that would make antibodies that could bind both the nitrated TNF alpha form or the wild type. And thus, um, you know, through measurements like this with ELISA, you can see that um, you'd have protective antibody responses then, and not just for TNF alpha, but for a wide range, <coughs> excuse me, of antigens. Um, so we were really excited about this technology. Um, we are interested actually in whether it'll, it'll uh, potentially be relevant for other kinds of antigens. But when we dug into this literature, one of the things we also noticed is, you know, in some of these studies, these antigens were administered as many times as like eight administrations within 18 days or very, very aggressive immunization scheme. I mean, it, it certainly will take some work to overcome the barrier of self-tolerance. Your body has a lot of reasons to, to want that barrier to exist. But one of the, the concepts that we had in my lab um, was what if you had a live vector being able to produce that antigen in situ? And now instead of needing to administer over and over again, you just have the antigen being made uh, in the patient and potentially at a, you know, whatever steady state or with some kind of regularity such that um, you might be able to get it on one dose. A lot of, lot of questions, obviously. That's a high-risk vision and a long-term thing that we're thinking about. But there were a few different reasons why we thought a platform where a cell could make nitrophenylalanine on its own and then thus produce nitrated antigens on its own could be really interesting. Um, and so to do that, we would pair our expertise in metabolic engineering with the genetic code expansion. Um, and this is the work of, of Neil Butler in my lab, who's a fourth year grad student, um, to build a de novo biosynthesis pathway to paranitrophenylalanine. We looked first, we, we applied the sort of traditional retro biosynthetic approaches. What kind of precursors in metabolism are related to this molecule? How could we connect uh, a biosynthetic pathway to central metabolism? And, you know, for us, uh, fortunately, aminophenylalanine is already one that has been produced and reported in the literature. And we have a good handle on aromatic amino acid metabolism. So we were aware of some of these chemistries. The real key enzyme in this process that's unusual to nature are N-oxygenases, because you find amines throughout metabolism, but nitro groups are something else. So could you find enzymes that could do this? And we think we had a good candidate from Pseudomonas chlorescens. 
So we started to uh, build out this pathway, but before we got into the cloning and all of that, we asked just what is the toxicity and stability of some of these heterologous metabolites that we're, you know, that have never been made before that we're thinking about. And so we just did simple doubling time experiments with supplementation of each of these compounds and first found that nitrophenolin is not that toxic, really. It's yeah, very close to wild type level of doubling time. Although one of its precursors uh, seems to be significantly toxic. So we sort of noted that. Um, when it came to product stability, um, we wanted to know, you know, if a cell is making this kind of a compound, is some other cellular process going to break it down or send it to a byproduct? And so you can monitor that through HPLC after supplementation. And we find that nitrophenolamine is relatively stable after 24 hours, 70% of what we started with is still there. Um, a lot of this uh, toxic molecule, paranitrophenolpyruvate, was depleted. And then when we actually looked at what happens when you supplement paranitrophenolpyruvate a little bit more closely, we saw that it was being converted actually to nitrophenolalanine, which is not unexpected in that many phenolpyruvate species, including phenylalanine and tyrosine precursors, are naturally converted to the chiral amino acids um, based on endogenous amino transferases. And those seem to have broad enough specificity. So we were, we were happy that you know, two of these steps are just being catalyzed natively. So we just have to see if we can get an oxygenation to work and enough buildup of the precursor. So uh, long story short, we did a, a decent amount of cloning here to, to set up the pathway. And we were able to show that prior to the introduction or co-expression of an N-oxygenase O to C, um, we, we could uh, reproduce um, para aminophenylalanine biosynthesis, as shown in the literature, achieving titers that start to be close to millimolar. Um, and this is very much in the range that people use in chemical biology in terms of getting non-standard amino acid incorporation within proteins. Upon addition or co-expression of the N-oxygenase of the C, we start to see for the first time reported um, paranitrophenylalanine biosynthesis. But we saw our titers drop a lot, and this wasn't very, uh, you know, this isn't very much. Uh, it improved a little bit when we went from two plasmids to one. But so then we set out to say, okay, what's, how can we improve that? We lost some flux into the pathway, maybe by modifying the chassis and doing some of the traditional modifications in aromatic amino acid metabolism to try to, you know, remove repressors, et cetera. If we could increase flux back into the pathway. And in fact, when we use this chassis, this NST37, uh, Delta PA, we start to see that the titers overall of the sum of PA phi and PNP start to increase again. Now we have a situation in our dust case where paranitrophenolaline, though, is the minor product. And these two amino acids are very closely related. They only differ by the presence of you know, the nitro versus the amine. So we don't want to have, create confusion for our synthetase, uh, you know, and so the goal is to make PNP selectively. So it seemed like the bottleneck was our n oxygenase So we used protein similarity network analysis to try to look at the landscape of n oxygenases which is a, there, I would say it's a relatively undersampled space. There have been some studies looking in specific secondary metabolite biosynthesis pathways at one or two n oxygenases we decided, based on the pattern of the landscape, to sample 21 different N-oxygenases from different clusters, uh, many clusters of which have never had a single variant characterized. Um, and when we did the screen, we, we gave them all either paraaminophenolamine or paraaminophenolpyruvate, and the N-oxygenase 16 stood out to us in our first screen as the more effective. I think we purified it and verified with our in vitro assay that it was more active than OBC. Then the question was what it would do in, in a cellular context. Uh, we also varied the medium, and we found actually that depending on the medium, but generally speaking, the co-expression of the NO16 N oxygenase rather than the O to C allowed us to achieve higher uh, paranitrophenylalanine titers, um, getting as high in the case of MOPCZ rich as our carbon as our medium uh, to nearly uh, eight, 0 0.8. Um, millimolar 
um, tighter. And that's what we're seeing on the outside of the cell. So likely the intracellular concentration is higher. And that's 80% of what folks would normally add to culture to, um, to achieve nitrophenolamine incorporation. So we thought that was a pretty good benchmark. Um, and we've written all this up and put it on bioarchive in the fall. Um, it's called de novo biosynthesis of paranitrophenolamine and E. coli. So there are other things that we've done here as well that we'll be excited to share you know, soon when ready. But for now, I'll just leave you with that biosynthesis story. Um, and I'll summarize my talk as, as Jenny saying, whether it's harnessing non-standard amino acids or creating them, um, we're really thinking about how these expanded genetic codes can help take synthetic biology to new places and how to do that responsibly. Um, so for example, you saw with synthetic oxytrophy, we have interesting fundamental science questions about whether we can do this in other microbes and tune the persistence, et cetera. And that gives us a really exciting platform to investigate, especially with bacteria either around mammalian cells or plants. Um, so there's new opportunities for synthetic biology there. And um, we're also really thinking about in human health, the opportunity to, to modulate immune responses, which could be important for vaccines, could be important for oncology, for autoimmune diseases. And our work with nitrophenylalanine is uh, the first of many steps to start to, to make an impact. Um, so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the folks in my group, our collaborators. We have a lot of great collaborators at Delaware, um, especially on plastics engineering, which I didn't talk to you about today, um, and some more medically oriented collaborators without whom we would be really struggling to, to do our nitrophenolamine injections. Um, and funding agencies and you for your time and attention. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, if you want to stay in touch, uh, follow us on Twitter or subscribe to our YouTube. Thanks, and I'd love to take your question. Wow, fantastic. Uh, really great combination of your training in church lab and Prado lab. And also you are also YouTuber, I found out today. So, so any question uh, from audience, anyone? Aditya, I just wanted to mention first, it was, it was a brilliant talk. Um, it's so wonderful to see how you're connecting not only the use of these non-canonical amino acids for biocontainment strategies and others and how that's emerged to, of course, their synthesis. Can you share with us, bring us in a little bit more about, in addition to the functional groups we wish to find, the relevance for bioprocessing, why it's so important, just kind of re-highlighting the need for synthesizing the non-canonical amino acids in the organisms themselves. Um, I, I mean, you know, you brought into it a little bit, but I, I think it's, it's probably worth um, discussing a little bit where I'd love to hear your opinion on how far you think we can push it. Obviously you're working towards this nitrated amino acid. Um, do you think we can really get to very parallel and orthogonal metabolisms to be building, <laughs> you know, wide arrays of these, these monomers? Um, that of course then lead to um, potential safe distribution solutions. Sure, thanks for setting, setting up that, that topic. I mean, I think it's a great question and there's a lot of places I could start, but I'll, I'll start with the simple sort of, let's imagine that you, you do want, that you do have maybe a centralized biomanufacturing and a biosynthesis approach. And so you want to form a protein that has some kind of augmented chemical functionality. I have, I guess, over time in my grant proposals, tried to refine some, some ideas for why you might want to have the non-standard amino acid be biosynthesized rather than have some, someone make a synthetic um, chemical and then add that to the process. For one, with some of these functional groups and the chirality inherent to non-standard amino acids, Biology and biocatalysis has a strength to sort of leverage there in making those molecules. Um, and it seems sometimes inefficient to have to do it synthetically, isolate, maybe do protection, deprotection, then isolate this chemical and then add it back into a fermentation when the cell all along could have probably made that molecule. The interesting thing also is that you don't necessarily need uh, a very high titer since we're talking about you know, non-standard amino acids in the range of millimolar supplementation, it's actually perfectly well suited to a cell's capability 
of, of being able to re rewire its metabolism without too much of a toll on its other metabolic distribution. Uh, or you could imagine sort of that, that growth phase and, and then production phase transition. But one, some of the other advantages could be that, well, now you could link it to transcription factor-based biosensors or other genetically encoded um, actuators to where you turn on the production on demand and maybe the genetic code is dynamic. Um, similarly, you could form amino acids that have difficulty getting into the cell where the current barrier is just the uptake. But now uh, if the cell is able to make it from its individual constituents, you've got the ability to harness these chemistries now through biosynthesis. So I could go on with a few other ones, but I mean, I don't, to be fair, I don't know in how many of these scenarios, I think there's just so many different non-standard amino acids that chemical biologists have empowered us to be able to use. Not all of these are real hurdles for each of those chemistries. Like I do think there are many that you could add in the media and they get into cells just fine. There are some that are toxic, but others that aren't. So I, I, I spend some time trying to think about this, the situations where it might make more sense. And I think it'll be case by case, but I love the idea of an orthogonal metabolism for sure. Yeah, no, th thanks for sharing your insights. Terrific job. Thanks. So any other question? Let me check whether we have chat uh, question. Uh, yeah, actually it looks like there might be three or four. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have a question, uh, Caitlin uh, asking question. You could speak up or I can read that for you. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Wonderful. Hi, I was just curious. So you, you built this path, you found this new N-oxygenase and um, you, know, you found it works better in E. coli. And I was wondering if you had any idea about why that is, like what's special about this this version and is there anything you learned from doing that search that would help you <laughs> or other people in uh, doing future searches for new enzymes? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Caitlin. And it's nice to connect with you again because yeah. I, I think I came to your Synbus, um, one of the Synbus uh, talks where you were present. Um, so if I go back to the um, the map here in our protein similarity network analysis, it does just so happen that the NO16 is from the same cluster where we find OBC. So the first, the first thing that we learned from this was that, you know, for actually, if, if I were to give you the full picture, sort of the very first question we looked at was how well do all of these express in our heterologous host under the same construct but before we make decisions or judgments about their specificity and activity, let's just make sure that they're solubly expressing. And of our 21 and oxygenases, we were excited to see that in this family of proteins with our conditions and constructs, which were relatively standard, we, I think we got high soluble expression of like 19 or so of them. So very high percentage expressed well. So we do think that when we are not seeing activity in our supplementation experiments, which was sort of our first pass, that likely the enzyme is made and probably just has a different species. Um, though we don't know necessarily that all of these clusters are truly an oxygenase. So we, we try to apply this general strategy to a few other cases of enzymes where part of what we're trying to do also almost from a taxonomy perspective is like define you know, the, the edges of the class of enzyme. In this case though, since we were providing really just two substrates, we're really looking for, you know, what, which of these clusters have enzymes that are going to accept these substrates. And uh, I think my student Neil did uh, a more detailed analysis with BLAST and maybe even used AlphaFold to make uh, uh, a, a homology model. Um, but we don't have more mechanistic insight into why the NO16 is superior. Um, we did do the pure, we purified them both and tried to do the side by side in vitro assay, and there, there's a, these are di-iron monooxygenases, so there is an iron core that has to be regenerated, and there are some peculiarities about this assay that make us think that, you know, we're not necessarily achieving uh, as high rates of conversion in vitro as we're seeing in cells, and so likely there are some other components that help regenerate the iron core. 
but this really gets out of our wheelhouse, although we would love to collaborate, you know, with folks to potentially be able to explain that. Our next step was probably going to be, you know, just surveying this cluster a little bit more deeply, maybe doing some rational mutagenesis, but we haven't necessarily needed to yet. Thanks. Yeah, as soon as you mentioned it was an iron enzyme, I was like, yep, that causes problems. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Kathleen. Any other question, anyone? If not, I want to ask one question. So uh, this fantastic, I, I love it uh, a lot. So I want to hear from you regarding your perspectives on the fitness of genetically engineered microbes in the environment, as well as mutations as the really intrinsic issues that are the common enemy to all bioengineers. Although you and I have been working on biocontainment for many years, because I'm seeing outside right now, my God, you know, my window, window, a lot of snow, I feel like more than 12 inch now. And I'm also, also wondering whether any organism could survive outside. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were gonna say whether they, any organism could melt the snow and maybe like, save you from having to, to shovel your driveway or something like that. Yeah, that's something like that. That's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think I, I attended a workshop uh, held by the EPA that, you know, I know you attended as well on risk assessment and, and the idea of biological containment. And it's, it's such an interesting, so when I think about what's happening right now in the field, as well as just sort of general theory. Like, I understand that if you engineer a microbe in certain ways, particularly if you transform it to harbor plasmids, if it has some other kind of genetic payload or other burden that it has to deal with, then you expect its doubling time to be lower or it could otherwise get conditioned to laboratory and ideal environments. So laboratory strains, especially those that express large cassettes, are not gonna do well in the environment. That's conventional wisdom. But I've been surprised to hear that, you know, more, I've heard it more through personal communication than I've seen in the literature, that, you know, even hardy soil microbes that you might collect from the environment and then add in a very small non-burdensome cassette are not able to necessarily take a foothold it once reintroduced back into the environment. And I think some of those studies are not necessarily like the most conclusive yet, but it does point to this idea that these non-sterile environments have existing microbes that have uh, devised a number of ways to keep their foothold, their niche. And mm -hmm. it makes it really difficult for um, a, an engineered microbe to survive there. And so my first I have several thoughts then that come from that conclusion, which is, well, maybe that makes our burden lower as synthetic biologists in terms of thinking about safeguards. Yet that that is a slippery slope, in my opinion, of, you know, like that shouldn't make us think that biocontainment technologies are not required because we don't know enough about what situations uh, an organism might thrive or propagate in and all it takes is one to become like a major invasive species that has some negative effect and then holds back the field uh, forever or for a long time, GMO labels, et cetera. So, so I think it, it still makes sense. But then the other question though that I, I think about is if, if a microbe is not gonna be able to actually survive for very long, then maybe the biological containment is just an extra safeguard and maybe the applications that we envision should just be transient, you know? And I think some environments like in the gut where it may not colonize depending on what the pro engineered probiotic might be are inherently transient. And those are, and yet there's a lot we could do there. Um, and so whether it's that or agriculture, you know, I wonder what's the shortest time scale needed to make a difference. Um, and then what's something that we could, introduces a safeguard that's not gonna to be too burdensome so that the organism has a chance to like survive for a little bit and do its function. Uh, thank you. So very challenging question, but brilliant answers. Uh, thank you so much.
So I guess, I mean, we probably kind of close. So thank all for joining and staying today again, although many people are so busy due to the start of the new semester or stuck in the snowstorm like me. So we'll meet again next week on February 10th, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have Professor Mateus Kofas from RPI and also Professor King Sun from Texas A&M University. And in fact, Dr. Sun got PhD degree from University of Delaware. So I will stop recording for probably a few, uh, you know, a little bit more, you know, casual chat and discussion uh, from now on. So we can kind of relax because I'm stuck uh, recording. Well, I want you to stay, I mean, a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna stay. Yeah. I was just waving, yeah. like you said, I'm a YouTuber, so I'm waving to my YouTube. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, you know, still not, you know, typical YouTubers, I will stop.